these are two of the best TVs that you can buy right now. We've got the Samsung S95C and over there, the LG G3. The problem is they're about three and a half thousand pounds each for these 65 inch models, which is kind of ridiculous. So if you spin over here, this is a TCL 55 inch for about 400 quid. And it kind of makes you think, why would you need to spend five or six times more on a TV like that? Well, I'm gonna tell you. In this video, we're gonna run through everything you need to know about buying a TV from the picture quality, gaming, ports, sound, and also just how much you actually need to spend. So hopefully by the end of it, you have a better idea. And I'll leave some links to my favorite recommended models in the description below. And if you do find this video helpful, a cheeky like and subscribe would be lovely. Tip number one, don't buy a TV right now. Although I guess it depends when you're watching this, but the cycle is pretty much the same every year. In January at CES, all the big manufacturers announce the new lineup of TVs. Then a few months later, around May or June, they launch them, but obviously at the full retail price. But then three or four months after that, maybe around November or leading up to Christmas, we see big discounts. So the best time to buy is around Black Friday, Cyber Monday, or in the lead up to Christmas. Or really, if you can, and you don't mind going for last year's model, pick up one of those, because you'll save a lot of money versus buying a new TV that's just come out. In fact, this LG G3 is already a couple hundred quid off uh, when it launched like last month as I'm recording this. So if you can wait, I would definitely recommend it. And to be honest, the year on year upgrades often aren't that significant. A little bit brighter, a little bit faster maybe. Uh, although I would say for this year with the G3 and the new uh, Meta MLA technology, which we'll talk about more later, we have seen a significant improvement in brightness, but for more regular TVs that aren't crazy expensive, there often isn't that much difference year on year. Tip number two, look past your regular big brands, your Sonys, your Samsungs, your LGs, because while they do offer fantastic TVs, recently over the last three or four years, the likes of TCL and Hisense have really disrupted the more affordable budget market. And you can get some terrific TVs like this for some pretty crazy cheap prices. As I say, 400 pounds for a 55 inch 4K HDR TV with Dolby Vision. Uh, we've got an eARC port, nice and thin bezels, and also Fire TV built in, which I really like. While it is fun to look at the latest OLEDs and QD OLEDs, for the vast majority of us, this is the TV that we might actually be able to buy. As fantastic as these higher end flagship TVs are, and you know, in this room side by side, you can definitely see the difference, particularly in the image quality. I think it's gonna be a tough sell to convince you to spend five times more on that. And as my dad always says, it doesn't make the TV shows you watch any better. Also, newer budget models have plenty of goodies for gaming, like 120 hertz, VRR, and auto low latency, although we'll come back to these later on. Tip number three, and we have to talk about size. Really, the sensible thing to think about is, how big is your room? Will it fit in your room? Is it gonna look ridiculous? And also, of course, budget. The bigger you go, the more expensive it is. In my book though, the bigger the better, if you can get away with it. For example, the jump from 55, which we have here, to 65 over there doesn't sound like a lot, but in real terms of screen area, it's 40% bigger on this guy. And I think for me right now, the sweet spot is 65. To be fair though, in my living room, I do have a 77 inch LG TV, uh, which is again about 40% bigger than a 65 inch. Although what I would say to the five of you who are maybe considering buying an 8K TV is don't go for anything under 75 inches. You need at least that size or bigger to really appreciate that 8K resolution. Also, if you do want a bigger screen, maybe consider last year's models. For example, this 65 inch LG OLED C2 from last year is nearly 500 quid cheaper than this year's 55 inch C3 and they offer very similar picture quality. Tip number four, change the settings. Even if you just spend a couple of minutes flicking through the different picture modes, it can make a big difference. For example, most TVs will come in the standard mode, but then you'll have Filmmaker or Expert Bright or something similar. And generally, you, well, you can see here, this is vivid. And maybe if you're watching a Pixar movie or football or something and you want the most crazy contrasty uh, and vibrant picture, but most of the time I stick to like an Expert or Natural mode or Filmmaker mode. This is generally the most accurate for colors. A little bit darker, but if you're watching movies, this is what you want. Couple of simple things, make sure it's in home mode and not like a store or retail mode because that will give you really blown out colors. Uh, also turn off any kind of eco mode generally. I mean, that might save you a little bit of money, uh, but it will also uh, drop the brightness. You might prefer that, but genuinely I always like it as bright as possible. Also make sure you've checked for updates because they can add new streaming apps or improve the processing a little bit through updates. 
Game mode is also essential for consoles and helping to reduce response times for gaming. Although most new TVs will automatically switch to game mode because they have ALLM or auto low latency mode. But we also have to talk about motion smoothing because while this can work well for sports, making 24 or 30 FPS video look like a higher frame rate and making it easier to keep track of the fast movement, most of the time for movies and TV, turn off motion smoothing. It can create an overly smooth, cheap looking soap opera effect. Luckily, there are often less intensive smoothing options like LG's cinematic motion, which selectively smooths fast motion while backing it off when things become more static. But as always, with the TV you buy and the settings you use, it's entirely up to you. Get a soundbar. It'll make a world of difference to the audio from your TV. Uh, I have the Sonos Arc down here. Normally I'd have it on top of here, but I had to move things around for filming. And I love this thing. It's about 700 pounds and a year or so old now, but I think it does a great job. Although there are great alternatives from pretty much every big TV brand as well. Yes, it's more expense, and of course you can buy one later, but if you spend all that money on a great TV, then you'll probably want great sound quality to match. Pricier TVs already have pretty decent sound quality from their built-in speakers, with some even getting surround sound. Well, ish. But even these will be outclassed by a mid-range soundbar, and versus a budget TV, any soundbar will be a big improvement. Obviously, you could go with separate speakers and a receiver, but for me, I always find a soundbar a nice and easy all-in-one option. And there's tons of great models out there for pretty much every budget. I mean, you don't need a Dolby Atmos one with its fancy angled extra speakers that can bounce the sound around your room, but it does give you that extra level of room filling sound. Plus a lot of newer content does support Atmos. Most of the time you'll want to connect your soundbar or speaker system to your TV via an ARC or a more recent eARC enabled HDMI port. And this allows you to use your TV remote to control it. Anything that cuts down on remotes is fine by me. But TVs aren't just about specs and image quality. If you're gonna have a big black rectangle dominating your living room, then you want it to look pretty good as well. The good news is even more recent TVs like this that are a bit more affordable have nice and thin bezels and look pretty smart, I think. But then the more you pay, generally the fancier the design, both from the front and the back. Pretty much every TV you will mount on what we call feet or a stand. Although this particular TV over here, the G3, the gallery design from LG is meant to be wall mounted. They actually put the bracket in the box. And actually one of the benefits of OLED TVs is generally they're a lot thinner and particularly with new models where you have a uniformity of the thickness it can be pretty much flush to the wall this actually has ended up looking more like a 55 inch next to that which is obviously a foot or so off the wall so i would actually recommend wall mounting when you can obviously you might want to hide the cables which can be a little bit tricky but the good news is pretty much every tv is visa mount compatible or they'll have their own bespoke option like the lg just make sure the TV you're buying with its feet will actually fit on your TV stand or the table you're putting it on. As you can see with this one, the feet go almost to the edge of the TV, so you need quite a bit of space. Contrast that to Samsung's design, and on their higher end TVs, we have these pedestal stands, which are in the middle. Obviously, there's no issue with the edge of the TV being too wide for your TV stand. I must admit, I don't love these stands. I feel like the installation's a little bit fussy. It takes me like 10, 15 minutes compared to two minutes. But what I do like about some of Samsung's TVs, particularly higher end models, is their use of the One Connect box. So you simply have one cable around the back that connects the TV to a separate IO unit, which you can then either mount on the back of the TV or put anywhere else you like. And then you plug all your HDMI and extra ports in there. So there's less cables, less fuss around the TV. And if you are wall mounting it, it means you just have a single cable running down and that is it. Compared to any other TV, you're gonna have HDMIs, you're gonna have your power, it's gonna look a bit ugly. Now what we've done over here, which has taken a bit of effort, is actually drill into the wall and route the cables down. I think if you are gonna wall mount your TV, and spend a lot of money on it and you want it to look nice, I would definitely encourage you to do that because it looks a lot smarter. Let's talk about gaming. And to be honest with you, any recent TV, even cheap ones like this are plenty good enough. They're 4K, you got basic HDR, 60 Hertz. For the vast majority of games, that is all you need. Obviously there are differences in picture quality and the reflectivity of the TV. You can see my white t-shirt clear as day through this. But I think if you are looking for a higher end gaming TV, uh, you want 120 Hertz and also an HDMI 2.1 port. Cheap TVs are still HDMI 2, uh, more mid range and higher ends have at least one 2.1 port, which has a higher bandwidth, which means you can game on your PS5 Series X or even your PC at full 4K 120. Very few games actually support that. It's more about future-proofing. And actually the Samsung, the S95C over there, uh, does support 144 hertz, which is quite rare, but only for PC games. 
We also have extras like VRR, or variable refresh rates, which can help reduce screen tearing in games, and also ALLM, or auto low latency mode. And this puts your TV into its optimal game mode when it detects a console input. So turning off all that background stuff and giving you the fastest response time, which for high end and particularly for twitchy competitive gamers is really important. But arguably more important than all of that is how good the picture quality is. Which leads us nicely into tip number eight, image quality. The picture quality, which for a TV really is the most important thing, right? And I think beyond the 4K resolution, which pretty much every TV is these days, obviously you've got a handful of 8K models, no one really buys those, uh, and some very cheap, small 1080p models, but the 4K resolution is standard, and with that comes some level of HDR. So really what makes all the difference is what kind of backlight it uses, the contrast, the brightness, and of course, viewing angles for your mates sitting in the cheap seats at the side. Not everyone has that sweet spot. It's pretty important that your TV looks good from as wide an angle as possible. So your basic entry-level LED LCD TV may hit around 500 nits of peak brightness, while your more premium QLEDs and mini LED TVs can hit up to 2000 nits, while OLED TVs boast the best black levels. And brightness is particularly important when it comes to HDR content. Now the good news is that all new 4K TVs will support some form of HDR like regular HDR10, which brings out extra details and shadows and brighter areas and makes the whole experience more immersive, more vibrant. Then we have more advanced HDR like Dolby Vision or HDR10+, which will give you even more detail as each scene's HDR has been optimized. The thing is, even cheap TVs these days have Dolby Vision HDR, uh, but because the brightness just isn't that high, as I say, around four or 500 nits, it just isn't that impressive. Compared to a higher end or flagship TV like this that can push 1500, 2000 nits, those bright whites, the color, the, what they call color volume in their marketing spiel sometimes, it's just a lot more impressive. And I think that brightness, that nit level, the peak brightness is a really important metric to look at when you are reading reviews for TVs. Essentially, the brighter the better, particularly if you're in a bright room and you've got windows and maybe you can't control the lighting, you just simply want a brighter TV so it can offset the bright ambient lighting. If you're in a nice dark room, then perhaps an older OLED uh, that doesn't get as bright but has those nice inky dark blacks will be fine for your movies. Also bear in mind, there's a lot of magic going on behind the scenes. The processing, the upscaling, particularly from uh, lower resolution content up to 4K, how effective that is, is very much down to the process of the chip inside TVs. They're all pretty good these days, but generally the more advanced, higher end the TV, the better processing, the better motion smoothing, and the better upscaling you'll see. Very hard to quantify, especially on a YouTube video like this with compression, but it is one of the advantages of going for a higher end TV. And all this brings us to the big question of what is the best TV technology? At the budget end, we still have LED LCDs. These have been pretty common for the last five years or so, and they're absolutely fine, nothing wrong with them. The downsides generally are poorer viewing angles. Uh, they don't tend to have a great anti-reflective coating, not as bright, colors perhaps aren't as accurate, but a lot of those things are hard to see unless you have it side by side with a higher end TV. Nothing wrong with it at all, and the best bit is they're a lot more affordable. Blacks can also look a bit more grayish thanks to the universal backlighting, which can only dim the whole screen rather than individual areas. Now this is also important. While this is an LED LCD TV, it's actually a QLED TV as well. Basically that means that there is a quantum dot layer in the back of this that can help boost the brightness and give you more punchier, accurate colors. So it's basically like a slightly higher end LED LCD TV. And that is something that we're seeing a lot more, even on more budget TVs in the sort of five, six, 700 pound region. And it's definitely an advantage, but it doesn't bring it up to a high end QLED or an OLED uh, level of technology. As you can see, it's still not the best picture in the world, but it's better thanks to QLED. Then we have mini LED panels, which are a great upper mid-range option, and these get much brighter and have better contrast than your typical LED LCD, thanks to having a backlight with lots more and much small LEDs, so you get more precise lighting. These are also grouped into zones, which can be dimmed individually, meaning less backlight bleed into dark areas and improving your contrast and your HDR massively. So the rule of thumb for any TV, really, except for OLEDs, is the more dimming zones, the better. At the high end though, things get a little bit more complicated. We have Samsung's Neo QLEDs and LG's QNEDs, both of which combine QLED, quantum dot tech, with mini LED backlighting, kind of for the best of both worlds, and these are ideal for bright rooms, although they can be quite expensive for what you get. Then there's OLED, which I reckon is the best right now. OLED pixels can turn themselves on and off individually. They're self-emitting, which gives us near perfect black levels and contrast. They're color accurate, we have great viewing angles, and recent OLEDs are also brighter than ever. 
downsides? Well, they can suffer from image retention, aka burning, if you leave it for hours a day on the same screen and the same static elements, but recent TVs come with OLED care settings like pixel shift and pixel refresh, so unless you really abuse it and keep it on the same bright screen all day long, you're not really gonna have a problem. Also, older OLEDs can't get anywhere near as bright as a mini LED or a Neo QLED. However, some newer high-end OLEDs use the same quantum dot layer tech, hence the QD OLEDs that you may see from Samsung, or in LG's case with this new G3, we have a micro lens array or MLA, which massively boosts the brightness without really increasing the risk of burn-in. So that's all well and good, but really it's all gonna come down to what you can afford. And I would suggest looking at last year's model or even the year before that of a higher end OLED perhaps than a new cheaper LED LCD. Let's talk about these guys, smart sticks, because every TV now is of course a smart TV, which means it's connected to the internet and you have a variety of streaming apps, your Netflixes, your iPlayers here in the UK, YouTube, Amazon Prime Video, all that good stuff. Now you may not actually like the UI of the TV you buy particularly, uh, in which case you can plug in maybe one of these, which is a uh, Chromecast with Google TV or an Amazon Fire Stick. And actually this TCL comes with Fire TV OS as its UI, which is pretty cool. Uh, you've also got Apple TVs, you've got Roku sticks, lots of options and they're all dirt cheap, like 30, 40, 50 pounds. Obviously the Apple TV is a bit more, uh, but that is a great way of not only bringing your old TV into the 21st century if it doesn't have a great uh, smart home hub like this, or if you just simply don't like the look of it or it doesn't have the app you want, get yourself one of these. Okay, let's wrap this up. And I think my number one takeaway would be read reviews because one 4K HDR QLED TV is not gonna be the same as another 4K HDR QLED TV. You've gotta look at the brightness, the backlight, the contrast, also what UI, does it have the right streaming apps, the ports, HDMI 2.1, Lots of stuff to consider, lots of stuff that you probably don't really care about. So read reviews, they'll break it down for you. The good news though, is you can't really buy a bad TV anymore. They're all variations of good. And also if you want some of the higher end features, but to be honest, you can get away with buying last year's model or the year before, or just spending three or 400 pounds on a decent 55 inch TV. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions at all, leave a comment down below and also let me know what TV you're using right now. And if you enjoyed the video, a like and subscribe would be very much appreciated. I'll see you next time right here on The Tech Chat.